You're listening to the MindPod Network. Friends, lovers, psychonauts, consider supporting the It's All Happening podcast by heading over to iTunes and leaving this podcast a review. It's all happening. It's all happening. It's all happening. It's all happening. Hello, friends. Welcome to the podcast. It's all happening with Zach Leary. That's me. I'm your host. Episode 129 of the podcast. Wow. Can you believe it? All right. This week on the show, we have David Seidler, who is a friend and a colleague, and he's also the Oscar winning screenwriter of The King's Speech, amongst many, many other things. But uh, that is a fantastic compliment. And we'll get into it more with David in just a minute. Uh, and yes, this podcast, like every podcast I do, has an intro. Um, and, it, you know, the intro isn't about news or politics or anything. But boy, oh boy, is it hard not to talk about uh, all that stuff going on in the world. Oh, my gosh. The climate change report that came from the White House as a result of 13 government agencies uh, compiling their data um, the chaos going on at the border, um, you know, it's basically just, uh, an, an atmosphere of, uh, of, of tension if you don't look at it right. And I think it's up to us to find the softness in our hearts and in our vision to, um, not let all of this horrendous news and this, uh, you know, the, the horrendous, uh, us versus them mentality that's going on in the world bring us down and, uh, you know, take the wind out of our sails and all the great work that so many people are doing. But wow, pretty intense out there, huh, friends? Goodness. So um, we're going to get into the podcast with David in a minute. But first, I wanted to talk about this. When we realize how finite are the limits of gratification or possible fulfillment within the play of forms then despair arises that despair is born of the world weary understanding that nothing in form can provide ultimate meaning it also forces and demands awakening and seeks transcendence of suffering if futile clinging to impermanence creates our suffering, letting go and making friends with change is joy. Liberation. That passage is from the Ram Dass book, Be Love Now, a more recent offering from our great wise teacher. I was calling in a bit of insight via the words of Ram Dass that relate to the nature of change and the relationship between the form and formless that change may uncover. Immediately, that jumped off the page and felt like the right words, so there they are. Recently, I arrived head-on with my own suffering because I made the decision to part with a valuable and special material possession. The reason for doing so was purely an economic one. However, doing this made me painfully aware of the delicate balance of material possessions and their ability to provide satisfaction, and even their ability to act as a symbol of accomplishment. The parting of this possession created a narrative that I had failed, that I am a disappointment to myself and to those around me. This wonderful thing that I had bought when financial abundance was a plenty, was such a moment of jubilation. Look, I must be doing okay now. Look how great this is. Now, fast forward nine years later, how could I possibly have fallen down so many steps that have resorted to parting ways with this thing? All of the stories, all of the LA shiny objects comparisons made me feel shitty about myself for a minute, especially since I was somewhat fond of this particular object. It took work and bearing witness to see that I am not this car. I am not a summation of all the things I own. 
My self-worth is not dependent on how much stuff I have. This may sound like an obvious spiritual 101 principle, but when I'm in it, it's not always easy to see it. Change is inevitable, and liquidating assets is a part of the experience in the material world now and then. Many people have to do it, and now I had to. Finding out how to make peace with this relationship and to not dwell on the sea of self-obsession is my work right now. Any embarrassment that I feel from having to sell this object must be met with self-love and self-care. The most important part, the most potent part of this lesson, at the moment anyway, is the awareness that I've been seeking validation from the outside. So in a sense, I'm grateful that this experience gave me that knowledge and the power to be able to let it all go. All right, so that's that. This week on the podcast, David Seidler. He's an Oscar winner. He won an Oscar for Best Screenplay for the fantastic movie, The King's Speech. If you haven't seen that film, go out and watch it right now. Hit pause, in fact, on this podcast and go watch that film. It's incredible. But David's life is a fantastical tale of somebody who has led 10 lives in one, intertwining... Um, many countries, many professions, many um, areas of expertise. He's truly, truly a, a renaissance man in the uh, most epic sense. Um, he wrote The King's Speech, and he wrote Tucker, and I know him, uh, I know him right now because we're working on a documentary about Timothy Leary. So it just seemed appropriate we had to do a podcast. David is a fantastic mind, a fantastic sense of humor, and really a beautiful soul. Uh, so I hope you enjoyed this podcast. David, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for being doing this. Thank you very much. This is, uh, this is a red-letter day. I'm uh, losing my podcast virginity today. That's fantastic. Well, I'm, I'm honored to, for you okay. to do it with me. <laughs> It it's, won't hurt. Uh, it might hurt the first time. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for doing uh, it. I appreciate it. It's an auspicious day to do it because uh, <clears throat> I think I may have peaked this morning. Uh, With I, your cognitive Well, load. no. I, I was woken by a phone call from uh, a producer on a project, a uh, script about Denzel, sorry, not about Denzel Washington. Denzel is going to direct it, but it's a, um, it's a project about Miles Davis called So, so What. Right. Awesome. And I heard this morning that Denzel loves the first draft, and I've been summoned to the house on the hill tomorrow at three o'clock in the afternoon for the first note session. Amazing. So that was kind of good news. Congratulations. That was followed about a half an hour later by a call from my theatrical producer saying that the Chicago Shakespeare Theater has decided absolutely that my play of the King's Speech mm. will open their next season. Congratulations. September 19, and start a 24-week national tour ending up on Broadway. Well, that's fantastic, and you're right. Being on the "It's All Happening with Zach Larry" podcast after that, it's exactly. only and, downhill. And, and that okay. and that fulfills a childhood ambition. When I was a little boy, and my parents used to take me to the theater in New York, mm. I just had these wild little dreams of one day play by David Seidler. I mean, I had no idea about writing or anything, but so that's actually going to happen. That's amazing. Which is nice. And then the final, you know, things always come in threes. Yes. Right? Then I got an email that uh, a film of mine, Hiding Hussein, about the man who hid Saddam Hussein from the Americans for nine months. Uh, we're signing a contract with Nordisk Film, a Scandinavian outfit, to produce it. So, Congratulations. And it's only one o'clock. Yeah. So, so but you, what's going to happen this the, afternoon? A couple of things that you mentioned there, but first, you said when you were a little kid and you, your parents took you to the, you said Broadway, yeah, yeah, and you saw, you know, a play by so and so. Was that your first um, 
I guess, was that the first thing you wanted to do in the arts? Was you wanted to be a playwright specifically? Or make, what, was, what came first? Well, I wanted to tell stories. Hmm. I mean, I think that's, that's my strongest trait. Being a storyteller. You know, we all have traits. Sure. And mine is being a storyteller. But I was a stutterer. So telling stories was difficult. I couldn't do it. I had to write them, which is why so many stutterers are writers. Uh, Somerset Maugham, uh, Aesop of Aesop Fables. Yes. Many, there are many others. Uh, you have to tell the story the way you can tell it. So that was my first thing. And then I found that narrative prose did not come easily to me. Too, too many words. <laughs> okay. But dialogue did come naturally. And uh, from there, it was obviously a very easy step to say, ah, plays, plays. Tell me what was the first thing you ever wrote? The first thing I ever wrote of the first play? No. first thing I ever wrote was a little short story, I think borrowed very heavily from O. Henry, okay. but it was the story of a penny from when it first goes into circulation uh, and all the various people that handle it yes. and until it gets lost down a drain into the sewer. Oh, I've always pondered about the, uh, you know, they, they can do those um, fiber tests on dollar bills and, mm. you know, there's still that urban legend, maybe it's true or not, but that... 40% of all bills in circulation have cocaine on them. Right. You know. right. <laughs> and I, and well, I just. 90% have germs. 90% have germs, right. And I just love that because, you know, the cocaine that implies there's somebody's DNA on that that probably went up their nose or something like that. And just following that, who knows where these bills, what inside, uh, you know, I where think they It depends been. which city the bills are circulating. <laughs> <laughs> so you. Um, you're, I'm sorry, 81? I'm 81. You're 81. So uh, age being subjective, but you did, you grew up in a very interesting time. The world was a very different place. Oh, yes. Actually, the change in my life, uh, although profound, is not quite as profound as my father, who grew up in a, uh, a world that didn't have electric lights. Right. Um, Internal combustion engine, I think, was just being thought of. Amazing. But cars were not on the road. Right. Certainly not air, airplanes. Right. And, um, you know, by the time he finished his life, he was on the Million Mile Club on Pan Am. And, and <laughs> you know, life had changed. Uh, but, yes, in my life, it has gone from World War II. Uh, there have been some... Unfortunately, it seems to be coming full circle because my family came here to get away from fascism, authoritarian governments. From where? From, from England, okay. which was going to be invaded by Hitler. That okay. was the that foregone was the, conclusion. Okay, got it. And uh, my family was Jewish, not practicing Jews, but that's our heritage. Yeah. And... Here I am living in a country where authoritarianism is <laughs> alive and well, and anti-Semitism is very much alive and well. It's an eerie feeling. Do you, I mean, when you were a young man, you know, like all young men are, you know, when you're, you're bright-eyed and you look at the world and you're just, you ponder the state of the union, not just for... Uh, your own life, but the world around you, you're like, oh my gosh, there's so much going on. What did you, um, like, what era was the first era when you became aware that, like, oh, the world's an, an interesting place. I wonder what's going to happen. Was that like a, a well, World War II or after the 60s? Like, when did you first start sort of pondering world affairs? Because in the time I've known you, you're obviously, you watch the news, and like you just said about you know totalitarianism on the rise, but um, you know and the reason I ask is because sometimes when I ask uh, older people, the answer varies. Some people say, "Well, there's always been problems in the world. This is no different." 
I like I would tend to think this is pretty different. Well, that's a wide open question. Yes, it is different. And it's different because for the first time, humanity is actually facing its own extinction. Just a few weeks ago, the world was given a report by the UN Committee the on Climate Change, on yeah. climate change yeah. that gave us 12 years, which is a flick of an eyelash in terms of time. Yeah. We have 12 years to halt and start to reverse global warming, or we are extinct. In three generations, yeah. the world will be basically uninhabitable for our species, and we will be as dead as the dodo. That's never happened before. Right. And so that is a, a stunning, stunning change of events. But in my own lifetime, I first really connected with the nuclear testing of the Cold War. Hmm. Uh, and I was part of the movement that protested against atmospheric testing. I mean, it was bad enough they were blowing big holes in the ground. But atmospheric testing that we were all going to breathe was just an obscenity. And uh, that's when I f spent my first nights in jail. Uh, I was living in New York, my first wife, and we went to a movie in Times Square. Mm -hmm. And when we came out, there was a whole crowd of people. I mean, thousands, tens of thousands of people sitting down in Times Square protesting against nuclear testing. And New York's finest mounted policemen charged us with batons, wow. smack, smacking heads. And I saw Julian Beck and Judith Molina, who were sort of the king and queen of New York off-Broadway theater in those days. And he got his head just split wide open. And I was appalled. And somebody shoved a piece of paper in my hand saying, there's going to be another protest tomorrow in front of the Atomic Energy Commission building on Wall Street. And I felt I had to show up. Well, there's a huge difference between a organized protest on a Sunday afternoon in New York and something on Monday on Wall Street. <laughs> so I showed up there and there were maybe 40 of us bedraggled youth and <laughs> the the cops swept us up beat us up a little bit huh. and threw us in the tank we were in the tubes and uh, oh, the famous New York City tubes what year is this approximately uh, this would have been about uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 62 maybe 62 or 60, yeah, around 62, I think it was. Okay. And I was in the tombs. And of course, I knew I'd be coming up out of the tombs for night court. And I assumed that my wife would be there to bail me out. And I come <laughs> up out of the tombs. And sure enough, there she is with my best friend. And they smile and they wave. And they don't bail me out, and I'm taken <laughs> away again. When I did finally get out three days later, and I was in the cell with a very nice murderer, uh, I said, Marianne, why, why, why didn't you bail me out? And she said, oh, your friend D Dave Schetzlein, novelist from Oregon, said, oh, David will be furious if you bail him out. He's, he's far too pure for that. He doesn't want to be bailed out. <laughs> <laughs> so that was my introduction. But I was then very much aware of anything that really affected our, our world, mm. our atmosphere, our, our, our environment. It was bad enough to have political problems. Yeah. But when they threaten us as a species... I get very alarmed. Well, in the early 60s, I mean, this is, uh, you were an early adopter, I should say, of conscious protism. I mean, like this, the, what we now call the 60s hadn't really happened yet. Yeah. You know, Kennedy was still alive and the hippie movement hadn't 
hadn't, uh, you know, hadn't really taken effect. So it's really, you know, telling that you were, I mean, my mom always points this out to me, like life in the 50s, everything was fine. You were taught everything was fine. Everything looked fine. You had no awareness that there were any problems. I had awareness. I mm. was, uh, mm. obviously, I, I went through high school mm. and adolescence in the 50s, and it was the silent generation. Wow. And I knew it was the silent generation, and I was extremely disturbed by that. Uh, actually, mm. I got involved in my junior year at Cornell, which would have been 58, mm. there was the first campus, quotes, riot that was not just a panty raid, but was politically inspired. Right. Uh, and once again, a kind of strange involvement. Uh, I knew my friends were organizing this thing and they wanted me to be part of it and draw the signs and everything. But I had a huge term paper that was due the next day. <laughs> so I said, guys, I, I, I really can't do this. I've got to do the term paper. So I stayed up all night doing the term paper. And when I went up to the campus, to the quad, to deliver the term paper to the professor, there was this big riot going on. And one of my friends, Kirk Sale Jr., the, the writer, uh, had a big megaphone, and he was, and the proctor of the university spotted me, and he said, and he knew me, we knew each other pretty well, he said, Seidler, you've got to get up there and stop this, because as long as they're outside, we're not going to do anything, it's fine, it's great, but if they go into the buildings, I've got to call, the campus police are outnumbered, I'm going to have to call the Ithaca police, and, you know, it could get really ugly. So I raced up and I told Kirk and he gave me the megaphone and I spoke to the crowd and they didn't go in the buildings. That was great. Then we all went home and thought, that's it. What I didn't realize is that a bunch of the frat boys went to the home of the, of the president of the university and broke all the windows in his house. He was a little upset about this and he wanted the ringleaders and of course, the next day in the Ithaca paper is the picture of me addressing the crowd. He said, that's the guy. Get him out of here. Expel him from the university. So. Fantastic. Well, I mean, as far as, uh, you know, optimism goes, I mean, that is, I mean, just looking at it uh, through uh, the cup that's half full lens for a second, I mean, the good thing about the modern age, as far as I can tell, just being... Um, a student of history because I, I was not uh, around back then, but protest, questioning the government, putting it out, you know, on the front page, um, having a counterculture, an alternative culture that is just completely, you know, not going upstream like you're supposed to do is a very prevalent thing these days. I mean, you know, the counterculture, however you want to label that, from deadheads to Burning Man to ravers and everything in between, is a pretty large, you know, it's not exactly a subculture anymore. So that well, being... And, and, and no. by the way, you yeah. have to include, as despicable as they are, yeah. you have to include the young skinhead white nationalists mm. because they too are protesting they're protesting sure i think badly and for a cause <laughs> that i think is disgraceful but nonetheless they are they are part of the protest movements they are but it, it, and the point of me saying that is like all of these things being true what do you think is it about our culture or our species that doesn't change what is it that causes us not to make the changes? Like we were talking about the climate situation or you were, the nuclear context you were talking about. But why don't we do the things that we need to do? Basically greed. Mm. Uh, greed as translated through power. No. Um, I, at one point in my life, I was in Fiji and I was political advisor to the Prime Minister of Fiji. <laughs> and, uh, it's fantastic. 
and I made some considerable enemies, including mm. the Minister of Finance, who came storming into my office one day, absolutely livid at an article I had written. And uh, he said, you, th you think I'm power hungry, don't you? He said, I'm rich, that's power. He actually said that to me, <laughs> right? Money is power. Well, of course, as obscene as that was, he was right. Money is power. Yeah. And that's why things don't change, because, I mean, uh, Eisenhower took him long enough, by the way. Everybody says what a great president he was for his <laughs> final speech. It was after the fact. Exactly. Yeah. It would have been great if it yeah. had been his first speech yes, as president. Right. But he did get it, that the military-industrial complex right. has a stranglehold on America. The Pentagon has immense power, and they don't want to let that power go. So the country always has to be in a crisis. That's what makes the political, uh, I was watching a clear and present danger last night. That's what makes the Potomac two-step work, yeah. crisis. Right. And exactly. if they don't have crisis, they'll manufacture crisis. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. So turning to, to crisis and, uh, and, and the 60s, um, I mean, protesting in the early 60s and then, you know, the assassination of Kennedy and everything that uh, can kind of leap out of that Pandora's box. But what was the beginning of the 60s? Now that lo uh, you looking back on it, what do you think was the beginning of the 60s? I think the 70s. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. Yeah. Uh, I don't remember the 60s, at least my 60s, as being really the 60s that we think of now. It just was what was happening. It was what was happening, right. and it became the 60s in the early 70s. That's, right. when it, that it, that's when it became all psychedelia and LSD right. and your dad and sure. all of that. But uh, the 60s, certainly the first half of the 60s, was a reaction to the silent generation of the 50s. Right. And it was coming out of that silent generation, and it was uh, it was more the beats. Right. The beats were the strong culture. By the way, you you see, there's a a bust there of uh, JFK, yeah, yeah. Uh, given to me by my uh, producing partner Clara Hendon, and we're doing a project. I hope if it <laughs> ever gets, if the contracts ever get done, yeah. Um, about a aspect in American history that is unknown, but he had he had many lovers, of course, yeah. but he had one very important one, uh, Mary Pinchot Meyer, mm -hmm. who apparently uh, turned him on to marijuana first, which he liked a lot because it helped his back pain, yeah. and then she took him on a journey with LSD. She, she was a Washington socialite, very bright woman, artist, and she had a small group of women who did LSD, uh, including Catherine Graham, the publisher Washington of Post. the Washington Post. Yeah. And they were getting their LSD from your dad, hmm. uh, and she turned Jack on, and it had a profound effect. While in office. While in office, right. absolutely while in office. Right. And he came out of this journey realizing what we are doing is insane. The Cold War is absolutely insane. We could blow each other to smithereens at any moment with yeah. one wrong move. And he started a peace offensive of his own. Yeah. He wrote to Khrushchev saying, we've got to change this. And at first, Khrushchev read his letters and said, you know, what? What is this wise guy? You know, he, he, he's trying to fool me. This is a trick. Yet, yet. Yes. But then the letters kept coming, and he started believing it. Yeah. Showed it to his generals, who also said at first, yet. And then they said, yes, I think this guy's for real. 
and they negotiated the limited test ban treaty. Right. And, and there was a speech in September of 63. At the American University. In Paris. Wasn't it the American University in Paris? I know it was the American University. Whether it was okay. Paris or D.C., I'm not sure, but okay. it was American University. And he basically said, the Cold War is over. We've got to just... And three months later, boom, yeah, boom. he was shot. Was shot. Yeah. And a few months later, Mary was also assassinated because she had a diary. She had kept a diary about all of this. And... I mean, tell me more about this, but as far as I can make out, and um, to be honestly, I read about half of Mary's Mosaic, pretty, pretty mm -hmm. dense book, but that, that following that bouncing ball and that mm -hmm. sequence of events, um, his relationship with Mary, and then supposedly turning on, but the speech in September of 1963 is, I guess, that's the proof that we have that something happened to him, right? Yeah. Because, don't forget, when he was elected president, mm. he was the quintessential Cold War warrior. Yeah, right. And by the end, he was the peace president. Yeah, most people were, I think, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, like, my, my, uh, my dad gets a lot of um, flack for cooperating with the CIA when he was at Harvard in the early 60s. But context is everything. At that time, and I remember him telling, I remember this very well when he told it to me, in 1961, if the CIA came knocking on your door, that wasn't a bad thing. Mm -hmm. That wasn't a big, scary, ominous, like, you know, deep state, you know, Illuminati cabal, terrible thing. It was like, you were proud of that. Yeah. That means you were on their radar. And that was like a good thing. I don't you know. know. I got questioned. That's how he the, thought about it. I got questioned by the CIA at that period. Mm. It would have been either 60 or 61. Mm. I had made friends socially <clears throat> with a Russian correspondent from Pravda's based in New York. Mm. He seemed like a really nice guy. We had a lot of fun together. And then I got a visit by the FBI and the CIA saying, you know, he's a spy. And I said, well, I had no idea he was a spy. <laughs> and they said, well, you know, if you can help us entrap him. And I said, guys, <laughs> no. This isn't my game. It's not my game. I, I, no, no, no. So let's go back to Kennedy for a second. Yeah. So Kennedy getting assassinated. Mary Pitchell Meyer. How long was that after? Nine months. Nine months after. Um, that was really the end of the presidency as we, Absolutely. Up, as we knew it up until that point, right? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, and... At the time, it, most people didn't believe that Oswald acted alone, right? I mean, that, right. was, that was like the first right. conspiracy theory, right? Yep. So what's happened? Why do you think that was so significant in kind of changing the, I mean, the government story is one thing, but changing sort of the consciousness of the, the public and then our lack of, of, of action because, you know, you, you look back on it and, you know, the, the, the sixties that were so idealistic, they had so many great ideas, but some may argue it failed. So with this knowledge, all of these great things that were, and sadly some terrible things that happened in the sixties, what, what went wrong? What fell apart? Well, I think that you've put your finger on it. It mm. was the assassination yeah. of Jack. He was a much-loved icon. And May young. I say, I personally, at that time, didn't like him. <laughs> I thought he was a, I thought he was a power-hungry politician in liberals' lambs' clothing. I didn't believe he was liberal, uh, uh, and I didn't vote for him. You voted for Nixon? No, oh. no, no. I was going to vote for Nixon. I wasted my vote on. Senator Wayne Morse of Oregon, a liberal <laughs> senator from Oregon at the time. I now have come almost full circle. I, I recognize the fact that he made a huge transition, and I admire him for that. But aside from my feelings, he was highly regarded, well, not by conservative Republicans, but the rest of the world loved him. Yeah. And here is this young, handsome, 
charismatic president who gets shot. Yeah. And we all felt that we were being lied to. Nobody believed that Oswald did it himself. Mm. And then there was this feeling of helplessness. Our leader has been assassinated. We're pretty sure we have been lied to. And there's nothing we can do about it. Nothing we can do about it. I mean, just little minor details. Alan Dallas was the head of the CIA when Jack was elected. Mm -hmm. And Alan Dallas convinced him that he had to do the Bay of Pigs invasion. He basically lied to him. He gave him false information. The Bay of Pigs turned out to be an utter disaster. Yeah. When that happened, Kennedy then did his own investigations, discovered that he had been fed false information, and fired Alan Dallas, okay? who was a central member of the Warren Commission, Alan Dallas. Hmm. Wow, all the pieces really line up there, right? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Switching, I, I don't want to totally... Yeah, because uh, I, uh, I have not made a career of being a conspiracist theory guy. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. This, this is not really... It's a little side issue. <laughs> well, of all the, you know, I'm, I'm always, uh, yeah, I never know what to think. But uh, as far as conspiracy theories go, that one and and 9-11 are my go-tos that I'll, mm. I'll stand behind. Chemtrails and uh, and fluoride in the water. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But, and besides, right now, I'm, I'm quite serious. Yeah. I don't think there is any other cause in the world as worthy as they may be that is worth dedicating your time to other than cleaning up the atmosphere. Yeah. The, otherwise, hey, we're all going to die, folks. Yeah. Yeah. It's a... What's the use of battling for uh, women's rights or gay rights or all these other wonderful things if there aren't going to be any women or any gays in three more generations? It's a tr tricky situation, and I think the and I, I I say it's a tricky situation because I even you know I catch myself often with um, you know just little behavioral things like buying too many plastic bottles or just little yeah. tiny daily things in my life. We're so addicted to convenience. We are, and uh, you know I recently just moved to Playa Vista, which is um, it's the Truman Show, right? You know. It's literally yep. like yep. This yep. it's ten years old. There's a Whole Foods downstairs. There's a movie cinema across the street. Everything's perfect, and we're addicted to this, to being pacified and the convenience. And it's very, very hard to change our lifestyle. And I just wonder what it's going to take. I think it's going to take some kind of catastrophe for people to be like, "Oh fuck, this isn't." Well, the trouble is, the catastrophe when it happens, it'll be too late. You well, know, once, I mean, once, Miami once, going away or London going yeah, away, something, I mean, like, something that. like that. Right? Well, I mean, mm. again, I'm not sure whether it belongs in your podcast, but why not? Sure. Um, again, with uh, with uh, my partner, Clara Hendon, mm. we've created an idea called Circles of 13, mm. uh, feeling very passionately that if change is going to happen at this last it's not even the last minute, it's the last second mm -hmm. in human time. Yeah. The only save, saviors are going to be mothers for Mother Earth. It has to be the feminine force, the feminine spirit. So the idea is to form a network, a worldwide network of circles of 13 women mm -hmm. in every little village in Pakistan, in every barrio in Caracas, everywhere, circles of 13 women working within their communities to do everything possible to aid and abet the stoppage of climate change. I mean, just little things like the plastic bottles, yeah. like don't burn the leaves that you rake, mulch them, stuff like that. Working, putting pressure on their local governments to do everything they can for sustainable energy. And own making candidates. This is non-political. Mm. It's not any party or any ideology. Yeah. But 
only vote for candidates who have signed a pledge to do everything within their power while in power yeah. to make the very difficult draconian choices that are going to have to be made. Sure, sure, sure. Well, I think that uh, I agree with everything you just said, and I think the, uh, the other element, too, is, um, is pop culture. I mean, like, you know, the great thing about the 60s is, you know, rock and roll moved people. Mm -hmm. It really, really, really did. Uh, I mean, we don't really have that today. I mean, like, especially around music. I mean, some might argue that, you know, Burning Man culture has a music thread. and that, But we don't have, like, you know, if a Beatles came along again today and united the world like the Beatles did, yeah. you know, that could be another. Or, another you know, force. Pete Seeger. We're, we need a new Pete Seeger. We need... Uh, or no, we need a new Miles Davis. We need a new Miles da Davis. Wait, so was the, uh, was the Miles Davis idea yours or Denzel's, or did you get hired to it to do it? Or was I it did get hired. Okay. Uh, that's kind of a fun thing. I, I got hired. I had my first meeting with uh, Miles and the producer, Rudy, Rudy Langlis. Very nice guy. Oh, you met Britain. Miles. Oh, sorry, with Miles. Denzel. Denzel. Oh, wow. Denzel. No, Miles okay. is gone. He's gone. I Although I have met with again. Miles. That's another story. Mm. That's a much story. Mm. Uh, yeah. Please tell uh, it. But I, I met with uh, Denzel at a sushi place, and that man can really eat sushi. <laughs> but um, I said, you know, guys, I hear I'm these two very talented, intelligent, brilliant black men. And I said, guys, uh, there's only one thing that bothers me about this. I do feel a little funny. You may not have noticed, but I'm white. I'm not black. <laughs> <laughs> and Denzel looks at me just blank faced, no expression, and then he says, Don't worry, I am. <laughs> and I knew it was gonna be okay. I knew it was gonna be all right. Uh, then then I had to deal deal with Miles. And I if I'm really into a project, I do connect with my characters and they come and they they visit me. They they occupy hang my, out with them. my office for a few months. Uh. Uh, like Bertie, you know, the King of England, yeah. George. Yeah. He was there for a nice, nice we, we, we had a lovely time together. So anyway, I tried to make contact with Miles. And man, he just wasn't having any of it. You know, what's this? Who is what's, this guy? Yeah, who is this old oh. fake guy here? <laughs> yeah, and uh, we have a friend who is a, uh, a PhD in business, has worked for some of the biggest companies in America as a consultant, but she has a little sideline. She channels dead presidents, you see, yeah. and, and, and others. So I said, well, look, if you happen to see Miles around, would you tell him I could really use some help, some advice, some cooperation? She said, all right. And she reports it a few days later. She said, well, I, I did see Miles. And he's just sitting there in a chair with a big sign that says private. I thought, yeah, that's, that's Miles, all right. I said, well, see if he has anything to say to me. So about a week later, she calls and she says, yeah, he finally had a message for you. Yeah, what is it? What is it? She said, well, his message is, tell him, just play the true notes and he'll be okay. <laughs> that was it. You see? So I, that didn't really get me off to a terrific start because I wasn't quite sure what he meant. Mm. And I had a very tough time connecting with the project until one day the penny dropped that I always work in a very sort of classic, form, formal way. You see that huge cork board there? Yeah. Well, I fill it with all my three by five cards of my research and all oh, this goes in the second act, this guy, this guy, and slowly a structure forms, sure. and then I write a very detailed treatment from it. And with So What, I just couldn't do it because I kept on moving around. I had to go to Portugal to do a mentoring thing, I had to go to Ireland, and the cork board didn't follow me. And then the penny dropped. I realized, I get it. I am playing a jazz solo. It's an improvised solo. Oh, right. Wow. It's not written music. It's you get 
Miles would give his musicians uh, a chord or a scale and go Boundaries. from that, guys. Yeah. And that's what I had to do. Once I did that, he came to visit me a lot. Hmm. And he'd say, no, man, I wouldn't say it like that. <laughs> well, the, uh, one of the great things Miles said about... Uh, about jamming and improvisation was in order to play outside, you have to learn to play inside first, right. which which I love. I remember that music school. So as far as with the creative process, I mean, there are two different, I guess, um, idioms there. One, you know, you have the cork board here where you're mapping out structure, and three acts and what falls where and stuff like that. The second one is, um, you know, hanging out with the subject you're, you're writing about later. Right if you want to call that spiritual or metaphysical, whatever you, you want to label it. But is one more important than the other? Do they need to work together? Is one a requirement? Well, I would have said that the cork board was the requirement. That's mm. the way I've always worked. Except, strangely enough, on the King's Speech, I did, I did do the cork board on that. But I didn't do the treatment. I just worked from the stack of cards that I'd put in some oh. kind of an order. So it was a halfway point for me. But Bertie and Logue did definitely come to visit me. They were in my study with mm -hmm. me a lot. The first time that had ever happened to me, may I say, was years ago, my first gig in town was writing Tucker the man in his dream for yeah. Francis Coppola to direct with Jeff Bridges. Yeah. And, wow, Preston Tucker was in my study every day, <laughs> man. We had a great time together, and I, I really grieved when it was over, and he had to leave me. Well, and I'd imagine, like, uh, like a film like The, King, the King's Speech, um, I mean, the personalities of Bertie and Logue um, especially like the, you know, the idiosyncrasies, you know, the little, the quirkiness and, uh, like Bertie's temper at first when he goes to see Logue for the therapy and it's just his little, you know, interpersonal little idiosyncrasies like that, that can only be attained by hanging out with him, by communing with him. I mean, how else do you write that kind of dialogue? I would, I'm guessing, I'm asking. Yeah, but. yeah, but it is, you know... You're, you're getting at the answer. It is a combination of the two techniques, the, the, formal, the formal scholarly way of the mm. corkboard and intuition. Because in my reading about Bertie, mm -hmm. uh, a couple of times, a couple of even his official biography, which is as dull as dishwater, <laughs> it did mention that he did have quite a fiery temper. Yeah. And uh, he was a Navy man, and he had, as, they, as the British so diplomatically put it, salty language. <laughs> so I immediately knew the guy had a bad temper, and he swore like a trooper when he was angry. Then, then it's, he comes and he visits, and we do the scene, and he tells me what he wants to say, and, and, and then it, it all comes. But it, it's that combination. I wouldn't have had that if I hadn't done the research and knew the man had a bad temper and could swear. When you finished that script, uh, I mean, in the former, it was ready to shoot. Did you know that you had something special? Yeah, but I kept my mouth shut because <laughs> it would seem like such hubris. But I knew pretty much from the start this thing was going to be very big. I, ju I just did. knew it. You did. I had a gut sense. Uh -huh. And uh, in the editing room, when I could see it starting to come together, I thought, oh, boy. This is great. Yeah. And, uh -huh. But everyone was saying, well, you know, it's going to be a little art house movie for the 60 and over crowd. <laughs> and I'm thinking, no, it's not. <laughs> no, kids are going to love it because they know what it's like to be bullied. Yeah. And they know the value of a best friend. Uh, they, they will equate to it. Uh, I didn't quite realize how far that would extend. And I was really thrilled when I heard from the distributors that 
it was playing so well in black communities where they, hmm. as a rule of thumb, never really get foreign films. They don't huh. get, so quotes, art films. Right. But they were loving it. And the reason was obvious. They knew what it was like to be marginalized. Right. Wow. Huh. I, I, never, I never heard that before. So you're the first Oscar winner to uh, come on the podcast. Oh, there'll be many more. There'll be lining there'll up be now. More. Well, I, there's actually a couple more in the, in the pipes. But um, what, um, let me take it, you got to, I have to ask, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask, what's, what was that process like emotionally from getting nominated, find out you, finding out you got nominated? Uh, that happens, what, about a month before the show or two months? How long is it? About know. two months. About two months, right. It is the longest two months, may I say. <laughs> it is, you know, it's, it's not awards, it's a contest. It really is. Of course. Um, and you do need to have someone like the beloved Harvey Weinstein on your <laughs> side. I mean, yes, a dreadful, dreadful man, but... He he was huh. instrumental in getting that thing awarded its prizes because he spent a huge amount of money and he knew how to do it. But he was a brutal taskmaster. Yeah, I uh, managed to get very very sick doing all of the functions and the travel. Mm. And he didn't let up. I mean, there was a point where I really, really was ill. And he said, nope. And he had, he had me in a 40-hour period fly from here to San Diego, we do a couple of interviews, fly from San Diego to Las Vegas, do a late-night show in Las Vegas, fly from <laughs> Las Vegas to New York, to do a huge function in New York and then fly back to L.A. to do an AFI screening. I mean, wow. it took me six months to recover, and I'm not sure whether I ever really have. Well, the thing that's so perplexing about Harvey Weinstein to me is, you know, it's terrible of a human being he is, was, whatever. He did make good movies. He did, but you see... <laughs> or got good movies made. He got good movies However made, yes. You, know, you, 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 must see, you must realize that Harvey, of course, let the world know and wanted the world to know that he had made the King's Speech. He did not make the King's Speech. He was not the producer. Right. He was merely a distributor. Right. But that is the way he would present himself. That's the spin. Uh, and, you know, people would say... This is well before the Me Too movement yeah. <clears throat> and all of this came out. They say, look, we all know Harvey is a, is a crook, terrible man, but he loves movies. Yeah. And my answer to that was, and the rapist loves women. Yeah. So that happened for you. You were, I'm sorry, how old were you when you won the Oscar? 73. 73. Since then, um, I mean, gosh, in the, the year that I've known you, um, I mean, your life in the last, I guess, uh, what, nine years has, or uh, eight years has changed considerably. Do you feel that? Well, I don't know. I mean, in many you're... respects, it's gotten worse. <laughs> <laughs> I've been treated worse by the industry. I mean, uh, I mean, could not career wise, I mean, as far as your. Oh. It's been, yes, it's been a wonderful extended victory lap, which mm. I deeply appreciate and I am very, very grateful for. What I was, uh, mm. what I was getting at was something else, the <laughs> fact that, you know, I have not had anything made yeah. since the King's Speech. Mm. That's eight years now, eight, nine years. Right now, I think things are about to change because, uh, yeah. you know, Denz the fact that Denzel wants to direct this, if Denzel wants to direct, so what? So what is going to get made? Right. Uh, and uh, Hiding Hussein looks like it's going to get made in Europe, which is great. So things are changing in that respect. But I've been dogged by this thing of being hired for the wrong reasons. 
Mm. Producers will hire me not because they want my vision, but they want my name as an Oscar winner. We have an Oscar winning writer of course, right. on the team. Yeah. Gives the project heat. And as soon as they've got their contract signed, they want me to write the same old crapola that they've always done, <laughs> and I don't want to do it, and we have problems. Uh, and I've been stiffed twice. Um, so it's, it's been a tough slog, but I've learned a lesson now. I've learned try to instigate your own, your own projects and uh, try not to do things just for money, as tempting as it may be, because it's always a disaster. At least for me, it is. That is the perfect place to end. Thank you, David. Thank you.